I'm, I think I'm at the end. Right, Obi. <laughs> you sit here, Obi. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you, Robin. Um, no shortage of things for us to sort out in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, it is a great uh, privilege to be in this wonderful building to um, lead this discussion on these in incredibly important matters. And I know there's some other people in this room that have uh, been in this wonderful building at s events uh, of similar importance uh, of the past few years. I think I'm sitting almost at the point where Mario Draghi made his infamous will do whatever it takes, Stephen, uh, nearly two years ago to the, to the month, right here. So if we could have the same impact as he did, uh, that would be pretty good. Uh, I am joined by uh, four very diverse people that reflective of the... Uh, the exciting and complex world in which we live in. And I'm not going to go through uh, their bios because everybody's uh, are in the handouts. But I have Sir Mike Rake to my left, uh, currently chairman of BT and a very illustrious person influencing life all over the world and led from the Britain. And he chaired a panel that I was on yesterday, actually. Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, next to him, we have Obi from um, uh, uh, Africa, who is, of course, a senior economic advisor to the uh, Open Society Foundation, having done all sorts of important things uh, in my, one, of the, one of the mint countries, Nigeria, previously. Uh, to her right, uh, Ziad Bahar Eldin, a former, former interim deputy prime minister of Egypt. Uh, and at the, to my far right, we have Leo Puri, uh, managing director of UTI Asset Management, I think the oldest uh, asset manager in India. So, actually, I'm going to uh, risk something a little bit daft at the start. So I'm going to do a little survey of all you, you guys about our topic of globalization of winners and the losers. So um, I, I, I don't think there's really very good economic data that goes back by decade for the past 100 years. But there has been reasonable data for the past 40. 1970s was a pretty miserable decade for world GDP growth. Oil price crisis twice. 1980s, the world grew by 3.3%. 1990s, the world grew by 3.3%. Here's the dangerous thing I'm going to do. I want to ask all of you guys, a show of hands, what do you think the world grew by in the noughties? Was it the same 3.3% as the previous two decades? This is a decade with two big crises. Was it less than three? or was it more than four? So who thought it was 3.3, same as the previous two decades? And you're not allowed to not vote. <laughs> well, th three people. Who thought it was weaker? Who thought it was close to f or above four? We, we have a generally, thank God we have an informed group. <laughs> It was actually 3.7, according to the official IMS statistics. So I ask you that at the start, because as, as an economist, and of course, as Mr. Brick and Mr. Mint and whatever, um, it seems pretty clear to me that globalization is a good thing. Um, and I'm not quite sure, and that's what I'm going to ask some other people about in a second, why there is this intensity that we find ourselves in. Second thing I would say at the outset, I'm not sure people here are probably involved in this, but uh, the UN Millennium Goal to halve poverty by 2015 succeeded five years faster than the goal stated. I think, Kevin, that's probably the first time the UN has ever managed to achieve anything uh, faster than it said, faster than it said. So if world growth has accelerated uh, and world poverty is being reduced at a faster rate, what's the problem with globalization? There is obviously something wrong with it because it's just, well, it's on this agenda. Uh, and before I engage each of you, and I apologize because I've not notified you, is Winnie from Oxfam here somewhere? There you are. 
So what, is, what, are, what are we economists and other people doing wrong? Or is it our political... David Howell said something very interesting that I'm going to pick up on as well, I think, in the period. What, what, why, why, why is it? Am I, are, we, are, those, are those data irrelevant? Why is it? Why is it that people think globalization is so bad? Oh, thank you. I think I'm Winnie Pianima, I'm the chief executive of Oxfam International. I think that you economists, as you asked me to mention, have for a long time debated whether there is a trade-off or believe that there is a trade-off between, tra between growth and inequality, addressing inequality. And this debate has gone on for so, so long and allowed really the world to move to a situation that we see as dangerous where extreme inequality has been growing in the last 30 years so, so fast. And it is having a damaging effect on growth itself there is now an acceptance by the World Bank, the IMF, and others that actually extreme inequality slows long-term growth. It is harming social cohesion. It is harming democracy, undermining democracy. There is capture. Power is captured by those few that are extremely wealthy, bending the rules in favor of the rich, and locking out millions of people from democracies. The social contract between people and states has broken because of extreme inequality. And we've been researching this. We have the evidence that shows that across developed and developing countries, people are saying that the rules are bent in favor of the very rich. They are not in favor of most people. There's mistrust between people and states and governments. So all this means that now actually there's a growing consensus that inequality is bad for growth, bad for democracy, bad for poverty reduction, and we must act on it. Can and I that means we must do the normal things that are done to reduce extreme inequality. It's not rocket science. Winnie, can I sow a seed to come back to you on after I've engaged the panelists and others? because you express very clear thoughts there. But <clears throat> that's despite the fact I just cited what I think is pretty powerful evidence that in fact we have lifted in the past decade way more people out of poverty than in any time in previous decades. And so I don't, I, there's, there's something kind of odd, but let, let, let's, what, what, do you, what is it, Mike? Um, I mean, I think, first of all, one of the biggest issues we face, as I mentioned too, is a question of trust and leadership, and trust in leadership and institutions. It's not surprising, after five years of crisis, inequality, trade inflows, that we've got to a situation where people don't trust institutions, they don't trust uh, big politicians, they don't trust big, uh, you know, churches, they don't trust big regulators, and therefore we've got a problem that we face a number of issues, globalization, Many issues here have been referred to, Scotland, European Union, immigration, where we don't seem to be able to win the arguments on the basis of facts. There seem to be a lot of emotion and often issues there. So to globalization, I think it seems to me that we've got to build that trust that we can talk convincingly about why globalization is a reality. We live in an interconnected world on capital, trade, people, finance. You know, technology is accelerating that, and some see technology also as an enemy as well as globalization because of the, the feeling that in some areas it can cause detrimental impacts as well as productivity improvements. So we've got to be trusted and clear enough around why we live in an interconnected world and what the benefits are, how many hundred million people have been taken out of poverty, and the positives of it, that requires trust. Then we have to absolutely accept that there are issues here, particularly in areas of globalization, whether we like it or not, or whether the macroeconomic statistics show it, what are the things that we can do combining between business, politicians, trade unions, to make sure that we have sort of some principles, some spirits around the way we do business that recognizes that actually from a business perspective, we want everyone to be well off. Why wouldn't we? We want good, healthy consumers. We want healthy, democratic societies. So I think we, we have to 
find a way to build trust and then focus on areas where we can make a difference. Recognize whether we like it or not, significant parts of the population believe immigration is a bad thing, whereas actually we know that at a macroeconomic level, it's a good thing. So, oh. And it's, it's doing that, I think, that we've got to do, and then understand those tensions and try to take steps to deal with some of the inequalities that none of us, I think, were happy to see to continue. Rob, Robin has given us, Chair's guidance that we have to come up with specific solutions. Yeah. So we want to know how we build that trust, but I'll give you a chance to think about that. But, but Obi, so is, from, from your perspective, from an African perspective or otherwise, what, I mean, uh, m more recently, African people are getting lifted out of poverty from a very low base. Do you believe that globalization is, is helping people, or more importantly, perhaps even than that, is, is there the trust that it is from the world that you've inhabited and, and trying to help? Well, um, Jim, I think that it is important to acknowledge that um, global prosperity uh, has done better with uh, closer integration of countries. Most of the countries in Africa are small open economies, more today than they were in the 90s. So clearly, there's a universalization of the concepts that enable economies to grow. But with that growth on the continent of Africa, we've also seen manifestations of deep inequalities. In significant countries like um, South Africa and Nigeria, the widening inequality doesn't do good for economic reforms, which essentially are mostly market reforms. So the question is, why is that so? It's because capitalism gave itself a bad name as a result of the character deficit that was manifested during the global financial crisis. Um, the people who took the beating were the ones who were least supposed to be taking any beating on the behalf of a global elite class that lost its morals. Um, I think that um, uh, about 20 years ago, when I was one of the co-founders of Transparency International, we could almost predict that this was going to happen. Countries of the North simply assumed that issues of poor governance and corruption were things that happened in, in poor countries. But we could see a blind walk into a serious erosion of institutions and processes and procedures and basic character. And so, number one is how do we fix the issue of character deficit in the way that leadership is provided, whether at country level, institutions level, community levels, farm levels, and all the range of it. Number two, there is a universalization of the losers of, glo uh, of globalization. 40% of the unemployed in the world are young people. It cuts across the entire world. Of the, of the unemployment figures, 4% are adult unemployed. 12.6% are youth unemployed, unemployment rate. That tells you that there's this universalization of the losers. And so if there's anything that will give us a common ground for a discussion as to the nature of structural shift of the global economy, it's got to be these young people. They don't believe in any of us seated here today. They are not even in this hall. That's to tell you the level of alienation of this class from the real problems of the world. Chatham House ought to be getting the young ones to tell us to our faces Robin, what has been. a specific idea. <laughs> and then, you know, my final point, my, my final point is that as far as the, the countries um, in Africa are concerned, they actually are optimistic. Uh, they're optimistic that the future holds greater promise. And I see President Kufo, uh, who used to be president of Ghana, and he knows that there is that sense of Optimism. Well, let me push you, because uh, for people who might know, I've spent quite a lot of time uh, in, in Nigeria the past year, and despite all the staggering challenges, some of which obviously being highlighted now, it, it does strike me that, and, and, and despite your pa really powerful point about youth unemployment, young people um, of African descent are optimistic. There is net migration of people going back 
So if there was something that inherently bad about globalization, why, why is that happening? Why would they not be doing, I think in South Africa, I think it's actually a bit different, but in Nigeria, all the smartest guys from Silicon Valley in the UK, they're all going back there. They're not, they don't want to be here. You know, Jim, I, I like you. You're my friend, but you're asking the wrong question right now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, the, the, Where, the Ngozi, help me. I know Ngozi is <laughs> here somewhere. Help me out. <laughs> you know, because I mean, think think of it this way: uh, the, the, the there is there's no anyone today who is saying globalization is bad. Simple, is not being, it's not being analytical. Okay, they're not being empirical. Anyone who is saying globalization is so good, don't say anything negative about it. Is equally completely out of whack with reality. So what is the story? The story is we must have no longer a monologue between the, the anti-globalists and the pro-globalists. We need to recognize that there are real challenges of the kind that, you, that, that we've just all talked about. And therefore, for the Africans that are optimistic, they're optimistic because they see the benefits of integration into knowledge into ideas, into possibilities. They see all of that. But then they also see the weaknesses in terms of the capability of the nation state to manage the process and the volatilities that are associated with this global good that, that does have opportunities for them. So I think you, you, you talked about a character deficit, which is very closely linked, I think, to your trust deficit. So we'll perhaps build up on that in a second. But Zaya, let me bring you in. We, you were making some very interesting points to me at dinner last night, pointing out that in an Egyptian sense, and then we discuss about it in a broader sense, some of the big riots and protests around the world the past couple of years have actually been led by what we, we might even describe as, um, as, as the relatively better off, not, not the, the, the most poor. What, do you want to elaborate on that? Because it's a very subtle but powerful points in my opinion. Well, th this was in, uh, in relation to a specific comment on the Arab uprising and the fact that on the whole, looking at the last three years, it has been those who have benefited a little bit, those who have been somewhat in the winner's side, who were the, uh, the, the, the start, who were behind the start of the Arab uprisings and not so much who has completely uh, locked out of any benefit. Uh, and, and this maybe has to do with the issue of winners and losers in general. So who wins and who loses needs to be a little bit more defined. You, in your opening statement, you do refer to the key two issues in support of globalization in general. One is that world growth has been positive. And the second is that there has been some uh, greater equality among nations over the last couple of decades. Um, I think where the issue becomes a little bit more problematic and where globalization faces more criticism is looking at it nationally within the various nation states, within the various national economies, to what extent has it led to greater or less equality as a matter of fact. And there isn't one answer. The countries here have had very different experiences. Part of this is that we need to also think as to whether, you know, is poverty alleviation real poverty alleviation or is it synonymous somewhat with growth of consumption? So you may be earning more, consuming more, but then your, lev your quality of life, your quality of security, your quality of social protection, the level of anticipation for the future may be actually going down. And this is very serious for people who happen to be on the border of poverty. The other thing is that winners and losers also isn't a constant factor. Right. Uh, some of the, uh, take tourism as an industry globally, and especially in emerging economies, uh, you know, sure, banking and finance also have been, people working in those sectors have been part of the winners globally. Used to be, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but in a way, what you lose when in your financial sector may be your bonus, which could be quite significant, your end of year, uh, you know, uh, uh, payment, uh, bigger payment and so on, but you, you, you probably have a, a minimum standard guaranteed. Whereas, for example, in tourism, where uh, there could be a huge boom for a couple of years, 
when it declines, it really declines, and it wipes people's lives altogether and their capacity to, to really anticipate for the future. So winners and losers isn't a constant matter. The other thing is that look, looking at the whole winning and losing argument also requires to take a generational aspect into it. There has been a remarkable uh, uh, distinction in some of the emerging economies as to who has been on the whole benefiting from the growth and who hasn't been in terms of generational and gender distinctions. All of this to me is not to say that we should look at the issue as to whether globalization is good or bad. That frankly isn't the question. It's a little bit like saying, you know, uh, free enterprise or the, the entrepreneurial spirit, is it good or bad? It's good, but it needs to be regulated, it needs to be properly managed. Let, let, in some I want to get into a minute. I, th I think already there's a consensus here that it's a, it's a winner. So I guess the issue is what, what can we come up with to help the, the clear, specific losers? But your point that it, it's not a stable winner or loser is a very important one in trying to deal with that. But maybe we'll come back to that with some people here in a second. But, uh, you've had some interesting comments to say about India last night with the new leader. I, I, I think Shamut's pointed out that India's not done that badly the past decade, but on a relative basis, certainly compared to the guy that was sitting in the seat before you, from when I started in the financial world, India and Chinese wealth was pretty similar. It's not, it's not done as well out of globalization as, uh, as the, the big sea to the north, and the rest of the subcontinent not played. That if we were trying to identify a regional loser, the finger would be easily attracted there. What, what do we need to do to, to, to help that part of the world either play or get better protected or to be stimulated to benefit from it? What? Well, or anything all, else you want to say? I, no, I'd say, I mean, Jim, as you say, globalization is a good problem to have, first of all. I agree with that point. I think it's, it has lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty over the last four decades, and it has transformed the lives of many people in countries such as mine and across the emerging world. Um, if you take India, in fact, you do see within the country both winners and losers. There has been a class of people who post-94 have emerged as a very strong middle class, perhaps two or three hundred million. Um, and you've also seen a marginalized group, which is one of the things that has led to the Naxalite movement. The point I would make there is that, ironically, the reason why we fell behind was because of a paternalistic desire by essentially a socialist ideology to protect people from the impact of globalization. India as a country for many years had a, was led by a political class that believed it had a well-intended duty to protect the marginalized and alienated from the nefarious effects of globalization of the kind that Winnie was talking about. And I think one of the lessons that we have learned, and it is uh, clearly manifested in the way the democratic process and the democratic outcome that we've seen in the election, is that people have realized they do not need protection from globalization. They need to seek access to it. So whether it is subsidies, welfareism, agricultural procurement policies, these have actually served to impoverish and marginalize as opposed to accommodate the aspirations of people. So when you think about the solutions to the second order consequences of globalization, one big solution is simply the growing realization in countries such as India, but across the emerging world, that if you are a consumer, well, if you are a business, if you are fundamentally somebody seeking to offer employment, and it could be knowledge-intensive services using digital technologies, globalization is fundamentally your window to a better life. And the political class is actually having to adapt to that now fairly rapidly. And when we have this conversation 10 years from now, I can assure you, you will not be talking about uh, and questioning whether India is a loser or not. Uh, and probably the most important... I was really meaning its neighbors in the subcontinent. No, but, but it's, it's not that different for the, for the neighbors either. I think this realization has actually now dawned uh, on, on the country and is, is, is very clearly a watershed moment. So if you think of uh, how you're going to deal with the consequences, 
Within the country, I think there's already a recognition that openness, open societies, open economies are actually an avenue for growth uh, and an escape from poverty, very different uh, to the political ideology that we have had before. If you look at interstate conflict, it's not clear that multilateralism has helped ever, whether it was in the British Empire or the American Empire or during the Monroe Doctrine, nor indeed, I believe, will multilateralism actually help solve the problems that you're seeing emerging with the rise of China. Ultimately, there are only two solutions there. One is the return of old-fashioned bilateral diplomacy of the kind that you saw with Kissinger and Gorbachev, and you will see bilateral diplomacy as actually being the, the ultimate solution and the fora in which these issues will get resolved. Because as, and the second is overreach creates a reaction. When Britain overreached, it lost its empire. The Americans overreached as a result of the Monroe Doctrine. They have realized they need to withdraw. The Chinese will realize as they test the extent of their power and overreach, whether it's in the Pacific or elsewhere, that they need to accommodate this. And you can see alliances or associations forming which are bilateral, whether it's Russia or China or Japan or India, all of whom are frenemies, to use that term. <laughs> but all of whom are basically learning to accommodate each other, and they will do so through bilateral diplomacy. And I think one of the challenges that you have is as the world has thrown up great business leaders, I think rather than the colorless civil service that most countries produce today and call a diplomatic corps, you're going to need to see the revival, the revival of great diplomacy at a bilateral level because multilaterals can only provide a backup or a safety valve. It is leadership of the kind that a Gorbachev or a Kissinger and others have demonstrated, and that's where the second part of the solution lies ultimately. So I, there's, there's so many issues that, that we could... Can we have the rest of the day for <laughs> this? I want, I want to uh, raise two specifically and perhaps turn to this sort of national state versus global thing, which is so, such a complex angle of it. But, before I do, I don't know if we have any of the uh, any World Bank or UN research people here, but um, there's a gentleman here because link, linked to my evidence at the start, as I'm sure some of you are very aware, it's not got that much attention, but the International Comparison Program uh, has just revised their, their data on a PPP basis for many parts of the world. And from what I understand of it, if you follow that through to current uh, definitions of, of, of acceptable definitions of poverty, you guys are going to have to raise significantly the base level because it implies that poverty has dropped even 50% 50, 50 more than already what I said about the UN Millennium Report on, on this new data. So I emphasize again this point. What, what do you guys, does, does that make, we just had a, the wrong definition of what's poverty or? What, what do you think about these things? Yeah, I, I, I think basically, uh, Lunogelo from Tanzania. I, I wanted to comment, first of all, on the, the dilemma in terms of uh, growth uh, and poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. I think the experience of Africa has been that the, the growth has been driven uh, by the growth of sectors which actually don't create jobs. That's one, especially in the, in the, in the extractive industry. Uh, in, in mining uh, and, and petrol. Uh, and basically, uh, the key weakness of most of the African economies is that uh, most of the products we produce, we export without really adding value. And, and I think uh, we are glad that uh, Leo, Leo just talked about the uh, uh, bilateral uh, relationship. When China started engaging uh, Africa, uh, and, and really uh, trying to tell Africa that we need to invest in infrastructure, uh, in energy production, uh, in the road, uh, connectivity, etc. You saw also USA uh, counteracting by also coming with the programs like Power Africa, uh, which are so essential for us really to add value to our products. And, and we see that as uh, the post-MDG uh, uh, dialogue uh, is, is unfolding, I think the issue of infrastructure uh, development so that we can add value 
whatever to the products we produce before we export uh, can really help actually to create more jobs and therefore uh, re 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 reduce poverty uh, significantly. But I think the, the, the dilemma still, when you ra raise, uh, I think, the, the poverty level from the one uh, uh, US dollar to two, for example, that brings us to a, a different level of, of, of engagement uh, ourselves. And, right. and, and uh, creating jobs and uh, making sure that the sectors like ICT development also uh, play an important role in, 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 in engaging our youth and in, 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 in a knowledge-based economy will be critical. For example, we have Mozambique and Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda now entering into natural gas and, 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 uh, and, 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 and the oil production, making sure that we process and develop uh, industries which are, are regionally based will be key, actually, for, for us in terms of reaching more people. I think there was a highly revealing UNCTAD report published last February that showed those emerging nations that engaged the fastest with world trade were the ones that were seeing the fastest income rise and decline of poverty, which is, in essence, what you're saying. Winnie, you're itching to say something again. I want to engage all the current political figures or recent ones on, on an issue about this that indirectly David Hal picked up on, but Winnie. Thank you. Um, returning to this issue of regulating globalization, and the fact that wealth has captured decision-making, even global and national-level decision-making, bending rules in such a way that we are seeing widening inequality. Take, for example, the fact that we know that... Widening, widening national inequality, you mean? And, and even globally. If you take... We know, for example, that wealthy individuals, and I'm not talking about companies, individuals are hiding $18 trillion of money in tax havens, most of it untaxed. If it were taxed, would have about $150 billion coming back to both developed and developing country governments. Now, we know now that there is at least a move towards reforming global tax rules. But this is happening through the OECD, on behalf of the G20, again, a rich club of nations, and the poor ones who are cheated of taxes through illicit financial flows are not on the table, are not shaping these new rules that, will, that are supposed to solve this problem of illicit financial flows. We need to have a system a multilateral system, an open system where all countries can sit at the table and agree the new rules for taxation. A lot of what is happening is, is quite legal. You can have two companies in a country that, is mine, that one is mining, the other one is a sister company, giving it a loan, and then the company that is mining never pays tax because it's busy paying the loan to its sister company. That's okay, it's accounting. So a lot of this is legal, but it is immoral, it is wrong, it's driving inequality and cheating poor countries of the taxes that are due to them. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to, there's a few hands going up here. Uh, and over here, there's lots of hands going up. I I, I, it's gonna be very difficult, but let me, if, ask the five that I see to make their points quickly, and if none of you are political figures, I really want to engage the politicians in, on this issue as to the taxation point, because in a national way of dealing with it, it's down to the political figures to choose to do so, when you voted in or out. So start with this gentleman here. Uh, Richard Ottaway from the House of Commons, a political figure. Um, can I bring are you, you to about to tell us our taxes are going up? Um, but later, later. <laughs> um, can I bring into the debate the question of population growth? Um, Michael Rake men mentioned it briefly, quite legitimately, as a macroeconomic driver. But the truth of the matter is, is that no country, apart from one or two resource-rich states, no country has got itself out of poverty without first addressing its level of population growth. Um, and in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, hundreds of millions of young men and women are being born into an economic wasteland with, um, where there is already resource shortages, water shortages. And there are two things happening from this. One is we're seeing the 
dramatic growth of conflict. You look at the rise of Boko Haram, the, the situation in Mali, uh, the attack on the gas facility at in Aminas in southern Al um, Algeria. And then we're seeing migration, migratory patterns, um, uh, which is beginning to affect us in Europe. You're seeing the boat people um, coming across the Mediterranean into Lampedusa, the people dying uh, trying to get into Malia in, in Morocco. So Jim, when you pose the question, what can we do for the losers? I think that this should be part of the equation. Do you, want, you don't want to deal with my question though? The Conservative government will lower your taxes. Jan Eliasson, I suppose I can qualify as a politician. I was, for, I was foreign minister of Sweden and I'm a deputy secretary of the UN. Uh, on the uh, MDGs, as you started with, Jim, uh, you're right. The uh, extreme poverty has gone down, but the uh, state of affairs in the world is such that today there are more poor people living in middle income countries than in poor countries. So poverty is mainly a challenge for middle-income countries in today's world. So the inequalities certainly are a very important factor. And then the MDGs, who were so well formulated back in the year 2000, uh, the results are pretty varied. You know, there is great progress on primary education, good news. But uh, very bad news, for instance, on maternal health and on, uh, on sanitation with huge consequences. So, but I think we have a great challenge now to produce the next generation goals, which hopefully still keep poverty up front, uh, but also bring in sustainability and hopefully also the importance of institutions, the importance of structures that, that keep this direction. But I must respond to the, to the challenge to multilateral diplomacy from uh, uh, the last speaker on the panel. Uh, I, for, for, first of all, I think it's, should, we shouldn't put bilateral diplomacy in contradiction to multilateral diplomacy. And regional diplomacy also, by the way. I think we need all, all of them at this stage. But I would say it would be pretty ironic if in the age of globalization we go the road of bilateral diplomacy. I think that will certainly create many imbalances and great difficulties. And it's almost logically and conceptually impossible to do if you look at issues like uh, climate change or migration or any of those issues. I'm the first one to admit that we don't deliver as good a solutions and formulas as we would like to do in the United Nations. But I would say that if we don't strive to do so, we don't reach the, uh, the objective that I think we all should keep in mind, that in today's world, globalized world, a good international formula, a good international solution is indeed in the national interest. I think if we can come to that conclusion, we are home. Can I, in the, in the search for Robin's recommendations, can I push you on something very reflective of the broad debate, but your own national background? Um, Larry Summers said on an event like this with me a few years ago, that this was before he became Treasury Secretary, that if Obama was elected, it was all about turning America into a Scandinavia. And many, many economists think Scandinavia is the way for de the developed countries. Scandinavia knows how to deal with these issues better than most. Yes or no? I'm biased. <laughs> but, <laughs> you, I, but you, you would I be sympathetic. No, no, I think uh, uh, my, my father, who was a labor union leader, he, I asked him when I was the first one to graduate in my family in the 50s, from even high school. Uh, I asked him what was it that made Sweden uh, move from one of the poorest countries in Europe, which we were in the 20s and 30s, to one of the most prosperous. And he said three things, my son. He said, first, we invested in good infrastructure back in the 30s, it gave jobs to everybody, and uh, we got a good structure to build on. <laughs> Secondly, we introduced a fair and strong education system which made it possible for you to graduate, first in our family. And thirdly, we had very good and strong, honest institutions that we trusted and uh, who we were willing to pay taxes for. And he told me that in the 50s, the party that suggested increased taxes won the election twice. So I think this still stands. I don't think you would have this idyllic situation today, but... I know but there's some more hands here, but I don't want to neglect anybody over that side of the room if there's... 
There's a gentleman behind you. Why don't we go here, then we'll, the lady here, then we'll come over to here. I notice there's no political figures wanting to respond to the trust deficit issue, Mike, yet. But uh, we can keep trying. Kevin will. Oh, sorry. Please. Thank you. Evgeny Pregerman from Belarus. Speaking a bit on uh, behalf of the biggest losers, the youth. Uh, I just sometimes get a feeling that when we, f we become victims of the way we frame our discussions, like globalization, losers and winners, but then when we look at the massive social movements, especially youth movements, the ones that brought about some change in recent years, let's look at the Arab Spring in Ukraine, for example, it doesn't look like the youth there are any concern about globalization. What they protest against are local corrupt institutions. And by the way, they even ask for more globalization. So, of course, Europe is, might look a little bit different, but I guess it, it might be the victim of this discussion as well. So I'd be interested to hear your opinions about that. So the lady to your left, please. Uh, Kishwa Faulkner, Liberal Democrat from the House of Lords. I wanted to pick up three interlinked things that you've been trying to flesh out, which is inequality, taxation and democracy, because nobody's actually spoken uh, very much about that as yet. It's trust, trust, not necessarily well, democracy, it, trust. Well, it comes back to... It's related. I think it comes back to empowerment and the ability to change things. Therein the lack of trust, because politicians actually are seen as pretty powerless, I would argue. And I think the point is that inequality, I think on the whole, global inequality clearly has been declining in we know the Chinese figures and the Indian figures and the rise of the middle class and so on. But in developed countries, the nexus between inequality, participation in chucking out the bad guys who may be increasing it, and taxation isn't a linear relationship. In the United Kingdom, 29% of revenue is paid by 1% of people. So clearly the progressive taxation system works. However, the, if you look around at Europe in the financial crisis, in post-financial crisis world, you have had now, in the European elections, a rise of the parties, one could argue, the Christian Democrats, the right-wing parties, that are not the parties that would fight for the largely dispossessed people who've been the losers in what's happened in the last five years. It's very interesting that the population has actually voted in larger numbers for people who are not sympathetic to their cause. And I think therein lies that thing about democracy, that when you have taxation on income, you get people making very clear preferential choices and the majority is still better off than the minority in Europe. When you get taxation on wealth, the parties that advocate wealth taxation on the whole do badly because it affects the aspirational classes. So the decline in trust, I think, is about an inability to find solutions, really, where you can still capture the democratic mandate, come out as a winner, as the th party that supports that kind of thing. You clearly don't, or, or s usually don't, I would argue. Kevin, before you answer, let me sow another seed, which, going to David's point, is it more difficult as a major national leader to lead what you think is doing to do the right thing with 24 hour seven media highlighting every single bit of anything. Is it, does it make it harder? Or because of the temptations you just say something that sounds good. Is this part of the trust issue that, that Mike and only are on about? As well as the broader issue and policy. And, and the same for business as well, of course. I think anyone in the uh, exercise of 21st century uh, national political leadership is simply lying if they don't say they're not affected by the immediacy, the demands, and the insanity of the media cycle. Um, it's a very simple axiom in global democratic politics. You feed the beast or the beast feeds on you, the beast being the media. Um, and, uh, and therefore, whoever I deal with around the world and have dealt with over the last five or six years, um, either as Prime Minister or Foreign Minister, the, ex the experiences are much the same. So to go to the core question, therefore, of trust, because you've rightly pointed out to a huge player 
in the transaction of politics between elected leaders and those whom they are elected to lead. The complexity is this. How do you take an election mandate as a national political leader and translate that into a reality which is daily buffeted by global factors over which you at best have marginal control or influence? Now, this was brought to the absolute surface within a year of my election as Prime Minister with the global financial crisis which hung over the entire period. And therefore, the challenge is to create uh, the bond of language and delivery between a national political leader recognising the dynamics and the benefits of, uh, of uh, globalisation and capitalist globalisation uh, while being mindful uh, entirely of the dislocations being caused in the community on the way through, let alone the mega dislocation caused by the global financial crisis, which destroyed jobs throughout the developing world and destroyed jobs in the developed world as well. And this brings me to my final point about how um, that is best done and where we need to clarify our ideas before we go on to the business of how to communicate them. Idea number one is that capitalist globalisation is a good thing. Now, that is not a novel conclusion in the academy, but across politicians in the left and the right, at least on the left, it is a reasonably recent conclusion over the last 10 to 20 years. Number two... That, is, that you think has survived the past five years? Barely, barely, which brings me to the, sex quest, the second question. What type of capitalist globalisation are we talking about? We've currently got three on the menu around the world. There's state capitalism, uh, and we see some models of that around the world. There's what I'd describe as um, uh, liberal capitalism in its most extreme form, Hayek and the rest, and we saw the outworkings of that in the crisis where markets didn't self-regulate. They actually destroyed um, innocent people and, and almost destroyed themselves, and the state had to bail them out. The third form of capitalism is what I'd describe as social democratic capitalism. It accepts three propositions. One, the overwhelming power of markets to generate wealth and to liberate people from poverty. Two, recognises market failure. Three, recognises public goods. And my final point is this. In terms of the trust factor domestically and internationally, what are those public goods? Essentially, a universal first class or the greatest extent possible education system, health system, and, and basic security and, uh, and a safety net uh, so that people can be enabled to make the most of their lives with reasonable dignity and huge opportunity. And if that's your conclusion domestically, to back up Jan Eliasson's point, then those are the conclusions internationally yeah. as well. They don't, this, this set of ethics in terms of that form of capitalist applied ethics don't, doesn't stop at each one's continental shelf. They have values for the world. So therefore the question is, which mechanisms prosecute that? Globally unregulated capitalism or one which is at least militated uh, by international institutions of the type which Jan's been talking about, not to protect them from the market, but frankly to transition them through the market and to sustain the global political constituency to sustain capitalism into the future. Uh, Robin, I think we have some things that are coming together here. There's two other hands. I'm ne completely neglecting that you, you guys are thinking, why did I come on a panel when I didn't even say anything? <laughs> um, this gentleman here then, one over there. We'll come back to the panel. Uh, thanks, Rob Bailey, Chatham House. I was very struck by your opening question, and it struck me that it isn't just GDP that grew very strongly in the first decade of the millennium. It, global greenhouse gas emissions grew very strongly as well, I think at twice the rate that they did over the previous three decades. And if we carry on on that trend, we're probably looking at something in the region of four, maybe five degrees of global warming by the end of the century. And I would suggest that in that scenario, there are going to be some very clear losers from globalization. And the first people to lose will be the poorest, most vulnerable countries. I think that's a task for the last, last panel of the day, isn't it, Robin? But we can offer some opinions on it in a second. Cheers, thanks. It's Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. I thought what Mr. Baha Eldin said was very important when he talked about the um, generational aspect here. Because after all, it's globalization that's hurting older people more than younger people. I think that's what we see all over Western Europe, and not just there, 
I mean, change, we all pretend that we like it. In fact, it's and terrifying. And yeah. just as <laughs> people in their 50s struggled desperately with the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think people in this post-industrial world in, in their 40s and 50s are, and later having a significant trouble with the economic change and liberty that young people are embracing. And I think part of the problem we've had is that governments have been very poor at protecting these people, and they've turned away from socialism too, let's not forget. They're mostly people, Tony Drew taught us this some time ago, who are turning to the right, not to the left, because it's the right that seems to protect them, that seems to speak to them. Um, and it is not a globalized ideology that they're paying attention to its nation and, and values and industrial might that belongs to them. Thank you. So let me, I apologize to anybody else that wants, we, we only have just over 10 minutes to go. So let, let me come back to my four panelists here with, with sort of two, seems to me, in the search for ideas, there's two things that I'd love to pursue more here. That, so I'd call it the the Scandinavian approach, where you use the taxation system more effectively to protect the disadvantage, and maybe this is a very, this is a developed country challenge, that's part of it. Or, related to this point, if globalization is, is generally a good, how, how do you support those that suffer from no longer being cheap places to produce stuff, unless you do the Scandinavian model? Uh, my own guess is you've got to go for some radical supply side type reform where the, the near term pain would be even longer. But without that, you have to go that route, it seems to me. But what, what do the four of you think about that before I come to the, uh, the second topic? I think. Uh, and is it applicable to, is it applicable one, to where one, you are, to, where, to your own? Volunteer one. Environment. I mean, again, it's, I, I think related also to Kevin's question, what type of globalization mm -hmm. are we talking about? And I guess certainly the model I would have had is some version of the Adam Smith version, which is you fundamentally have here the pursuit of self-interest. And that, ha that has been the primary driver. There's no point, I think, pretending it's anything else. And that was true of, uh, you know, the Romans or it's, it's true of the Chinese today. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if you fundamentally accept that the pursuit of self-interest can actually lead to outcomes in the same way that capitalism fundamentally believes you get the right outcomes through the pursuit of self-interest. And I think the dangers of overlaying something which is essentially an altruistic effort to rewrite rules and manage that has actually been proven now empirically, certainly in countries such as mine, to have had second-order consequences which were far worse than the disease or the illness, if you like, that they were aiming to cure, which is, yes, you will occasionally have market breakdowns. But those market breakdowns fundamentally need safety nets, not barriers. And what politicians have tended to do in response to the worries that have been expressed here is to put up barriers to globalization, which essentially is throwing the baby out with the bathwater instead of devising ways to build safety nets. And I think that's where the debate is shifting. Do you need safety nets? Yes. Do you need to build barriers? No. And I do agree, there is concern that what you're seeing in some parts of the world is a raising of barriers. You're seeing that in, in the old world, actually. You're not seeing that in the new world, because the new world is young, as somebody pointed out. And the young value the creation of opportunity much more than the offering of entitlements. But in the old world, they are still seeking entitlements. And I think that's a problem which politicians are not going to be able to solve. I think we'll find a Darwinian solution, if I may say so, at the end of the day, where that world loses. But the new world fundamentally is seeking opportunity, and that calls for safety nets rather than the barriers that were created by welfareism. And I think that's the direction the world is going. Let me, Mike, I'm going to jump to you, and I'll come back to yeah. that because this is, a, in some ways, a sort of developed country, the, the first one I'm focused on. As I put it back in, in Larry Summers' terms, he, he, I would debate, he was saying that, it's all about protect, which is what your issue is, about protecting Joe from Flint, Michigan. 
I mean, so your, your answer was no, you don't protect Joe from Flint, Michigan. You force Joe from Flint, Michigan to be capable of well, you give him dealing a with the world. Net, what, what, it's easy to say that, but how, if, particularly if you're one of these guys that's as an elected official, how the hell are you going to... Well, sorry, Joe from Flint, Michigan. It, I mean, it, it's, it's, really, you, it's so dangerous to be in sound bites in these areas, but a couple of things. Society, since time immemorial, has dealt with elites. Uh, communism led to elites. Uh, what we try and have in capitalism is recognize those elites with transparency, with balances and checks that allow the community as a whole to, to survive, do well, and do well increasingly, because that is in the interest of the elites. Now, we have to get that across. Then you get the trust. I did want to make a couple of quick points, particularly in specific. You know, I think what hasn't been mentioned, I, I think the biggest way out of the trap of poverty both in the developing world and the developed world, is education and skills and technology. And we mustn't lose sight of that, because that's the same in the UK. Our biggest problem is lack of was, skills. This is going to be my second issue. But, yeah. but I mean, it, it's so critical. And, and I think everywhere you see that. And technology is seen as a threat. It isn't a threat. It can be used with education to lift out of poverty to deal with these issues in a very, very positive way. On taxation, you know, in, in business, there aren't too many business people. I think perhaps we're underestimating how many, many businesses today are these last five years recognize they have to think differently about many things and it takes time about remuneration about longer term thinking about apprenticeships and developing about youth unemployment which is like a cancer of society right now and on the taxation point I do think this is a really important point that politicians have to grapple with because at a domestic level they attack businesses and individuals for not paying taxes quite rightly but on a, on a, on a global level they compete to try and encourage people to come in Just and pay less they taxes. Lower, they lower the corporate lower tax, the tax to, to do it. So we have to have a consistency here around what we do for society, which is about business leaders who are not trusted and politicians who are not trusted and regulators who are not known and not trusted, you know, together to work. What, what is the way that you do this to reach some multilateral accords? And it's idealistic, but unless we start to try and do that, we're not going to deal with a fundamental sort of disconnect that exists between what policies, what politicians will sometimes say in private, what they will say in public nationally, and what they will say in public regionally or globally. And we have to get some consistency. And I actually think there aren't too many business is really beginning to understand this, that this recovery has to be strong, and it has to be for everybody. We cannot have a situation where a lot of people in this country the last five years have said no, or perhaps a reduction in their, st their standard of living. To do that, to come to a point that was made, we have to invest to improve productivity. To do that, we have to have political environment which has consistency of approach on, on taxation, so you know where you are, and the consistency on industrial policy, so you know how you're investing, and a proper educational skills base. Do you want to say anything about how you deal with the trust deficit thing you raised at the start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly if, if we take it to a micro level, we're very conscious uh, here in the United Kingdom that we have a trust problem with business leaders, with politicians, with media as well, by the way. And we're determined to try and, and enter into a debate to try and get a better in the CBI, of which uh, is in the thing. I, I spent a lot of time as president of the CBI here. And what we really want to do is engage with different parts of society around what is the role of business, why business is part of and important to society and cares about society, what it is that we do that's important for society, and what are the things that we need to understand where we've, the public feel they can't trust us, whether it's about service levels, transferring bank accounts, wh whatever it might be, energy prices, transparency, how do we fulfill public expectation so that they can trust us to give a balance in the debate about society and the role in a capitalist system of business politicians and regulators. And that's what we have to do. And I think businesses have to speak the truth. I think politicians need to speak the truth as well. And, and I think that a lot of people don't believe that to be the case, either for businessmen or politicians. And I think that there's an element of leadership which is about telling people the truth. If we ran our businesses on the basis of focus groups, we'd be out of business <laughs> in between three and six months. Now, there is a balance here because for a politician it's tough because sometimes the truth is unpopular. They're inconvenient, some of the truths that we face at the moment. That takes courage and leadership, as I think was referred to earlier, around where we get that sort of courage and leadership from. Thank you. Let, let's go to the second issue, which is really more to do with the emerging world and notwithstanding, I think it was Stephen's point that there was, to describe it all as one is 
pretty ridiculous, to put it mildly. But with that caveat, there seems to be, a, at least from those who have opined here, and from the three of you, Leo, you had elucidated it particularly strongly, I thought, that the way to have your world do better is to actually take away the barriers and to engage better, particularly with education and trade. Is that right, or are we simplifying it too much? Let, let, me, talk, let me take this from the, from the point of view of improving the quality of globalization, so to speak. So you, if, if, if you want globalization to function better, let's say, and to produce more winners than losers. One thing that I find striking about the whole uh, discussion of globalization is that it is almost entirely within the realm of economic transnational forces and issues of information and information uh, sharing. So one way, perhaps, to consider improving the quality of globalization is to actually take it further. But by taking further, doesn't necessarily mean deeper, doesn't necessarily mean reducing further uh, uh, restrictions on, on competition and so on. It actually means taking it further in other non-economic realms of cooperation. Like football or something. Uh, well, I mean, you're going to do see, that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, in fact, you will see the biggest celebration of, of the survivor of the nation state in a couple of weeks. But, but what I mean is this, the, the way that the nation state has actually come a long way into accepting uh, the, the new international economic player as perhaps taking away a little bit from its own sovereignty. Right. It has not done that at all, or at least not in the same level at all with respect to other structures. Consider, for example, the hostility that you will find in most emerging economies towards cooperation between NGOs globally, between political parties, between youth movements, between even cooperation in combating non-financial crimes. And what you have here is a rather advanced world of globalization in economic terms, but extreme defense by the nation state of any other form of global cooperation. Now, I'm not an advocate of the, of the end of nation state at all. I think nation states exist, they will continue to exist, and there is such a notion as sovereignty that will, will have to be protected for a while. But again, just look at how much the nation state has evolved with respect to economic players and how much it has not evolved with respect to allowing globalization again, but on other than economic factors, on political and on civil society factors. Obi, I'm going to leave the last word to you. Solve the world in two minutes. In two minutes. Okay. So the first thing that I want uh, as a takeaway is clearly there is the ascendancy of the citizen. The citizens want to be part of the solution. They've been too often outside of the room when the business leaders and the governments try to fix the world. Nice point. And the citizens are symbolized even more now by these young ones. They have a sense of urgency about fixing the problems of the world. Our gentleman did say how the older ones are really losers in places like Europe. But the truth is, I'd rather the old lost than that the young did. Right. Because if the young lost, then it means that the, world, the future world is clearly not guaranteed at the level that we have all operated. That's too much of a risk to take. Second is that when you have inequality of the kind that we're dealing with, it means that there is necessity for intermediation and conflict management. What are the tools for that process of conflict management, intermediation, whether at a global level or at the national levels. Number three, the issue of the distinct roles of the market as well as the role of the public sector a la government uh, is right on the fore for our discussion. 
the state that is competent, the state that is intelligent, the state that is smart, and will most often work for the greater good of the larger number, will deliver better outcomes, whether integrated or not. But the more integrated, the better the outcomes from what we have seen by empirical evidence. So what it therefore suggests is that there needs to be a clarity of how the states that have eroded in capacity, whether at the level of social trust um, in developed economies or in developing economies, not just in terms of social uh, trust erosion, but also in terms of just mere capability of the state. All of these conversations are germane to ensuring that ultimately we can fix at the local level, that is at the unit level of the individual citizen, while at the same time gaining the benefit of a closer integration as a world. I think that's a pretty nice place to stop. Robin, over to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Against my phone. Yeah, a big thank you, Jim, to the whole panel. A fascinating discussion. You did get to solutions. Uh, a number of them I've seen taking down notes, and I think other people as well. All I want to do was A, say a big thank you to you and the whole panel for a great thing, and let people know we've got coffee next door. We'll be starting again at 11.45. Thanks for giving us a great start to the meeting. Thanks for engaging so much here, all of you, in the commentary uh, uh, with this conference so far. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, panel. A big handful of them. Coffee next door.